All right, so we're coming up to our last speaker of the day, and you already know who he is because he's been here for the last two days. Uh, Tyler Benster is my colleague, and Tyler helps to work with all the speakers and to choose content for the shows. Uh, Tyler has been traveling all over the world for the past uh, year and a half uh, visiting 3D printing companies. Uh, so we did a show in Shanghai, and Tyler visited uh, five or six uh, 3D printing companies in Shanghai, and the same thing when we were uh, in Korea. Uh, he's visiting companies here. So Tyler's going to share what he's learned over the past year and a half, and he also uh, wrote the uh, Waller's section, section of the Waller, Terry Waller's uh, research report on China. So he's going to share some of the information there and talk about the future. So let's give Tyler a big round of applause. Tyler, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. We're coming to the end of the conference here, so I have the great honor of trying to sum up the hype and all the buzz around 3D printing and turn it into a narrative for what the future will look like and how that will impact your businesses. So my hope with this presentation is that you will walk out of here with a better understanding of what the next few years of the technology will look like and what the current developments are in the industry that will impact your businesses and your interests in this space the most. So I'd like to start a little bit with the hype development and also trace my own story here in 3D printing. In 2007, I read an article in Popular Science that was about Hod Lipson's desktop factory. And Hod is a professor at Cornell and he developed a machine that could make objects out of any shape uh, with materials like silicone or even chocolate. And this captured my imagination and I started dreaming of all the different doorknobs or random things that came to mind that I could then make myself. So a year later, I became a maker, ordering a RepRep Darwin kit. And I was one of the first 350 people in the world to have a, one of these consumer desktop 3D printers. And a few years later, I also got an Super Ultimaker. Starter. So I have a, a fun time lapse of what that process looks like in case you haven't seen the process of building a printer yet yourself. What I love about the maker movement is that it's more than just it's more than just a, a technology for consumers, but it's also a foray and an entrance into industrial 3D printing. And I think many of us are here today in part because of these wonderful desktop machines, because they open the door and let us make on our own and brings manufacturing back to the consumer. Jumping from the desktop side, my interest then deepened and I want to understand how big companies and big commercial entities and industrial players were able to use 3D printing. So I spent the next 18 months learning from the best. This is now my 11th Inside 3D Printing Conference uh, and I have throughout this process done site visits to over 30 leading practitioners of the technology ranging from companies like General Electric and Shapeways and Boeing um, to the smaller guys all around. And I've also contributed to this year's Waller's Report, co-writing the section on China in particular. So today I'm going to talk about three key sections that are going to be impacting us here in the future. The first is machines, which is really the foundation for everything we're here talking about. And on top of machines is software which is the key to unlocking the potential of these fantastic devices. And the third is business models, building upon software and letting us come up with new ways of generating value for our economy. So let's start with machines. To understand the future of machines and the future of what will happen, sometimes it's best to look in the past. So let's look at the PC wars. And I'm going to highlight two companies and two products in particular. The first is the Xerox Star. Out of curiosity, how many of us have heard of the Xerox Star? Not a single hand. The Xerox Star was a groundbreaking product in 1982, priced at around $75,000. It wasn't just a single computer, it was multiple workstations that came together. It came with an Ethernet hub. All these computers were networked together. There was a file server that could store data 
and there was a networked laser printer, all in 1982. This dream would not be realized for more than a decade. And on the flip side, we have the Apple II. How many of us are familiar with the Apple II? All right, a bunch of people. So why do we know about Apple and not about Xerox? One part may be the price. At just under $2,000, uh, rather under $1,300, Apple II is much more accessible. Uh, but what's remarkable is that Xerox started all this functionality. You could do uh, what you see is what you get, document editing, complex data analysis, uh, multiple windows open on the same computer, uh, and you could do uh, incredible color gradients. And the Apple II, in contrast, was monochrome, um, one color, either on or off. Uh, no networking abilities whatsoever. But Xerox, despite inventing all this incredible technology, was not able to commercialize it. So the narrative here in 3D printing is, is going to be different. And let's jump into that. So is 3D printing like a PC? I'd like to highlight two recent technology advancements. Uh, the first is the touted uh, Hewlett Packard Multi-Jet Fusion, which we heard about from Terry Wollers' opening keynote. Truly a groundbreaking technology that promises to decrease the speed of 3D printing by 10x or more. And in addition to that, being able to vary material properties. Uh, and what will the price be? No one really knows, but something in the tens of thousands of dollars uh, seems like a reasonable bet. On the flip side is uh, Carbon 3D, a new upstart out of Silicon Valley that has another process with totally different material properties that are generally worse. Uh, but also promises to be 10 times or more faster. Uh, and I bring up this example not to say that HP is Xerox and Carbon 3D is Apple, but rather to examine that the bottom is going to be meeting the top. And this is a key push between these narratives. And this is a narrative that you are going to hear and we've heard over the past couple of days all over the place. And many people in the industry are Carbon 3D people. They are the desktop makers that create the desktop machines and push the narrative of a 3D printer in every home. Whereas other people are the service bureau model. And uh, how this will play out is a, a key thing to look at when considering where the industry is going. And the innovation is not just here on the plastic side, but it's on the metal too. Uh, one of the most phenomenal metal printers I've seen uh, is out in Xi'an, China at a company called Bright Laser. This is a three meter wing spar for an airplane that was printed in titanium. And in stunning fashion, they printed that in two days. There was another 28 days of post-processing involved, but I asked the head of product development at Boeing Commercial how long that would take them to make, and he told me it would take them 12 months. So this isn't going to happen overnight. Airplanes have a lot of certification and challenges associated with safety metrics. But just to realize that you can have a 10x improvement in how we process titanium is just phenomenal. We saw this with SLM Solutions, the speaker yesterday, showing how their machine had increased in speed by tenfold from 2004 to 2015. And that's going to happen again. So that begins the question. What is the theoretical limit? How fast can 3D printers really get? Now, I'm not a physicist, so I don't have an answer for you there, but I can confidently tell you that we will be able to achieve speeds 100 times faster than today. And how will this happen? This will happen by using continuous production. So if you look at the Industrial Revolution, it really began when we started using uh, new techniques for processing iron into steel. But it wasn't until Henry Ford and the assembly line that these incredible material advances uh, began a new consumer craze, allowing for products to be mass manufactured. And I mentioned in the panel yesterday that mass manufacturing and 3D printing are not incompatible concepts. And there's two examples I'll give. Uh, first is Voxel Jet, um, which has a, a binder jetting system. And they showed off printing at an angle, at an incline. So instead of doing a powder bed parallel to the ground in the build platform, you do it at an angle. And then you have a conveyor belt that is moving the powder back. So you're constantly depositing a new layer of powder. And at the tail end of the machine, you have the part that's coming out. 
So they could do continuous production on that. So you don't have any set up time, you can just continuously print and presumably clean off the part at the end of it. Another example is 3D Systems with Project Aura. 3D Systems has shown Project Aura having conveyor belt moving in a circle and having print heads that are stationary depositing material continuously. Uh, just imagine if you had a full assembly line of additive heads that were depositing material such that every few seconds at the end of that assembly line you had a new part coming off that could be completely different from the part behind it. We can make 3D printing 100 times faster, it just requires a new approach and I am confident that this will happen. So let's talk about software because at the end of the day it's great if you can build at high speed but if you can't build interesting things, what's the point? This is a beautiful part uh, that was designed by Nervous Systems, I saw inside 3D printing Santa Clara. You have these gorgeous articulating joints, um, and this is similar to what Rotesh was talking about earlier. This is a direct metal laser sintering process, uh, 18 karat gold, came off in one piece, and there's polishing and some post-processing, but there's no assembly or labor required. This is enabled by a new way of designing. And to understand that, we're going to have to get our hands dirty a little bit. So don't be afraid. We're going to put up something fairly technical on the next slide. We're going to uncover what an SDL file actually is. This is an SDL file. It's quite simple, actually. It's the same seven lines repeating thousands of times over and over again. So what is this? It's quite simple. It's just a triangle. You have three vertices that define a triangle, and that's it. It just repeats endlessly. On the other hand, we have uh, some other approaches that are more programmatic that are starting to become more popular, like parametric programs like uh, OpenSCAD over here, or OpenSCAD. So here, like uh, writing code, you can define a cylinder and have a variable for the height, which is H1. Uh, and you can define another cylinder, uh, which is going to be rotated, uh, that's going to be subtracted. That's the difference here. Uh, so this will create a part that is a cylinder with a hole in it. So imagine if you wanted to take that file and make it twice as tall. Easy. Just change H1 and double it. Now imagine with an STL file if you want to make it twice as tall. You have to change thousands of different triangles, which can introduce errors. And just being able to change things quickly has a greater impact than for the designer making one part. It also enables topographical optimization. Topographical optimization is a fancy phrase for uh, optimizing a part uh, based on certain constraint parameters. So in this part here, we have three points where this needs to attach to pipes. And we have a bounding box that this part cannot go out of. And given those constraints, a computer program will rapidly change parameters like this and evaluate the result. And it will end up with a part that is either impossible or practically impossible to design by hand. This would just be hugely laborious. And you can see an average of 40 to 60% weight savings for any part made out of titanium. 40 to 60% out of any part. Uh, that's what I've heard across the board. I've heard it from dozens of people in academia and commercial and aerospace um, and automotive. Um, and uh, it, it goes even further than this. Because you can engineer the interior of the part to have a lattice structure. Um, so this part here, again, we have the parameters has to attach with these areas. And then it has to fit a certain form factor. And then the interior of the part is even optimized for greater weight savings. So, besides redefining parts for performance, there's another piece of software that is going to greatly change our access to 3D printing, and that is 3D scanning. So, here's a kind of a vanity piece. This is just a 3D selfie that I, I got in China. A uh, quick 3D scan to print. And while this is fun, it's not really that practical. Uh, so, this is the type of thing that maybe people will buy one time, but now that I've had this, I don't feel I need to get 10 more. Anyway, so what we will see with 3D scanning is things around us in this room here. So imagine that uh, this cylinder on this microphone stand uh, broke. 
and I needed to make a new one with a big crack in it, it would be a whole lot easier if I could just take a, pull up my cell phone and get a 3D scan of it and then get the replacement made. But there's obviously limitations to 3D scanning. If we look around the room here, uh, it's unlikely that I would 3D scan a chair and print it. Um, likewise, the stage, you know, I'm not going to 3D print the stage or the curtains or the lights around me. So there's some serious limits you have to understand when you think about uh, this game, which is you look around the world and ask, what could you 3D print in this room? And what could you print in this room at equal or better quality than what is already there? So, it's a hard game, but still, for the applications where you can use it, replacement parts is an obvious one, uh, it's going to be game-changing to have easy access to these equipment. So let's jump into business models. I mean, touched on it a little bit, we're talking about scanning and how that changes the equation for accessing parts. But let me touch on a slightly more inspirational note. I'd like you to meet Asher. Asher is nine, was nine years old when he learned that Hanukkah and Thanksgiving were on the same day for the first time in history. So he invented the Minerki. Part turkey, part menorah, he then launched a Kickstarter campaign raising nearly $50,000. Unthinkable five years ago. A nine-year-old boy launching a manufacturing business. And this is the era that we live in. An era where having a 3D printer let him prototype and create the Minerki and Kickstarter, let him get access to customers and capital to actually create this. I recently gave a talk out in uh, Rhode Island in the United States, and afterwards, uh, a young student came up to me and told me how 3D printing changed his life. He showed me his hearing aid and explained that to him, this was a life-changing product because his previous hearing aid was cut roughly out of foam, it was uncomfortable in his ear, he couldn't hear that well, if it got wet it would be irreparably damaged, and his new 3D printed hearing aid fit perfectly, was waterproof, and he could hear the world around him better. This is one example of a product category that has been almost entirely converted into 3D printing. And we're starting to see this more and more. And we're having a domino effect. We see General Electric announcing that their fuel nozzles will be 3D printed for jet engines. Uh, we see Invisalign with the braces that are being 3D printed, the molds and the plastics made on top of it. And what's crucial here is that these aren't products that are 3D printed X, 3D printed Y. Rather, they're simply a superior product that happens to be 3D printed. So I challenge you, when you think about business opportunities, to make sure that what you're making is truly better than the traditional approach. And if it is, you won't need to market it as 3D printed XYZ. You will just be able to market it as the superior XYZ. And this is where education is playing a huge role. Uh, this is a classroom also out in, uh, this out in Weinan, China. Uh, they have a printer and a computer per student. And you look at uh, Zhuhai, which recently announced that they're going to roll out uh, a few hundred thousand 3D printers so that all their students will be trained on the equipment. And we've seen other educational initiatives in the US and Europe and in Korea, uh, but they haven't quite reached this scale yet. But it's really inspiring to me to see uh, the forward looking of recognizing that, yes, 3D printing is another tool, like woodworking, like cutting, like CNCing, but at the same time, it's more accessible. And it highlights this ability to dream of something, to actualize it into a digital file, and then to have this commodification of labor this machine that takes what used to be something that required a worksmanship, that now is just a commodity that can be purchased. And this goes into uh, this narrative here of the home versus the cloud. It's an important narrative. And you, when you run into people, when you hear someone speak about 3D printing, one of the first questions uh, that you can, might consider asking is, is this person someone that buys into the home narrative, or do they buy into the cloud narrative? And it's usually pretty distinct. Some people are adamant 
that there will be a 3D printer in every home, and that this is how we're going to be making a large portion of our goods in the future. And that would be people that tend to be on the maker side of things, on the machine manufacturer side for the consumer. On the flip side, there are others that buy into the service bureau. That 3D printing will be incredibly transformative, but it will be behind the scenes in service bureaus in the cloud. I don't think there's a right answer, and I don't think it's an either or proposition. But I highlight it because many people are in one camp or the other, and if you understand which perspective they have, you'll be able to understand their vision for the future and why they're making decisions uh, much better. And coming back to what I would call the ultimate promise of 3D printing, and I mentioned this commodification, this turning of labor into a commodity, uh, here is a simple equation for the cost of creating a good. What 3D printing promises to do is to remove labor from the equation such that making a product or a widget is just the combination of cost of the design, the cost of energy, and the cost of raw material. This is a dramatic transformation, and one that has yet to be realized. But certainly, if you look at a factory with 3D printers, you see fewer workers in there than one without. Something that's interesting, however, is that the maker movement would might argue that there is only two components of this cost of a good and that design should be taken out. I think there's a challenge here with maturity in the industry. If you look at the traditional relationship with CAD designers and how they earn a living, a company employs them, pays them a salary, and in return they make CAD files and they are paid for that work. And the company in turn makes money off of those CAD files because only they can make that product. However, in the 3D printing world, with intellectual property uh, being the key to making something, once that design's been made and you have access to it, you can create it. And if we look at music as one example, or if we just look at consumer behavior today, very, very, very few people have actually paid for a 3D printable design and then printed it. So, a question we have to ask is, what does this mean? Does this mean that, like the maker movement uh, pushes, that we should have everything be open source hardware and that the world around us should be freely accessible to make and create? Or as businesses, do we need to come up with Spotify-like models for all you can eat packages where you just pay a monthly fee and get access to repository of designs? I'm not quite sure, but whether design will be a component of cost or not is a key question in the future and one that risks holding back the industry by years. Because at the end of the day, designers deserve to be compensated. And if you want the best and brightest working on 3D printable designs, they need to be able to earn a livable income by doing that work. So I'd like to wrap up by just talking about uh, what I consider to be the crux of the issue here, which is that 3D printing is, is going mainstream and crossing the chasm right now. And it's happening faster than most of us realize. It's happening behind the scenes, like where companies are using 3D printing in ways that we don't expect, or in products that we don't even realize. Uh, I know that I was startled when I learned for the first time uh, that airplanes have 3D printed parts in it for years before I was even aware of that, and that they're already impacting my life in some way. And likewise, uh, I think there's many more products that have been aided by the product development life cycle, etc. But secondly, that the technology is getting much faster and better almost overnight here. And we're about to see this incredible rise in terms of the speed and proficiency of machines. There's a great quote by Ray Kurzweil where he says that being in an exponential time looks linear when you're living in that moment, but when you step back and you look at the, and you look at the change that has happened, suddenly you realize how fast things change. So while things appear to be moving at a consistent rate right now, in actuality it's moving at incredible rates. I hope that you share my optimism for the future and excitement. I'm so glad that you all came out to Inside 3D Printing and I hope to see you next year. Anybody have questions for Tyler? Last, last 
chance to ask any questions. Anybody? No? Yeah? Okay, Natasha. Tyler, great presentation. Um, what is your take on the material development and, and all of our conversations we've heard about that? What do you feel is going to be the next evolving material, you know, to overtake the industry? Hmm. Besides metal. <laughs> <laughs> So materials are an interesting one. I'm going to talk a bit about economic incentives. So 3D printing public companies are addicted to high margin materials right now. If you look at an ABS plastic, uh, if you buy it from Stratasys, you're going to pay around $250 a pound. When if you were to buy the raw pellets, it would be about two, one to two dollars a pound. Uh, and you see this across the board in the industry. So these materials are being commoditized and the prices are coming down rapidly. So what's happening, is that we're seeing new, higher performance materials that are being introduced. In the metal space, a great example would be as titanium powders are getting cheaper and cheaper, uh, more companies are starting to switch to Inconel, a higher performance, more expensive, exotic metal. And we're seeing similar things on plastics with Ultem being a big push right now. So I think material prices are going to come down for the materials most commonly used and that the next bit of materials are going to be the, these higher priced, higher performance materials and that is in response to these economic incentives that companies have to try and maintain these high margins that stock holders are demanding. Cool, anybody else? Questions? Yeah. Yeah, 먼저 그 좋은 발표 감사드립니다. 아, 예. 그 지금 해외를 많은 해외에서 3D 프린팅 산업이 어떻게 지금 진행이 되고 있는지 보셨는데요. 어, 혹시 저희 그 한국을 제외하고 다른 나라에서는 이 3D 프린팅을 이용한 그 교육들이 어떻게 진행이 되고 있는지. 그리고 그 어린 그 학생들이나 우리 친구들이 방금 봤던 것처럼 그런 창의력을 가지고 이 3D 프린터를 활용할 수 있는 그런 기회를 어떻게 하면 제공할 수 있는지 한번 그 생각을 듣고 싶습니다. 음, we see a few different types of training programs. One is uh, programs that are based on access. So trying to get as many students exposed to 3D printers on a one-to-one -one basis so that they can experiment, so that they can quickly fail and iterate and improve and then succeed. A second type of pro program is a more um, professional readiness program, which is a certification, or training approach, where you have someone go in for a workshop or a class uh, that then gets certified or trained on using more industrial high end machines. I think there's an important place for both of these. And you'll also note in that it can answer the same narrative of the home-based future versus the cloud-based future. There's different types of educational approaches for each of those uh, different visions. As for how to uh, inspire and uh, bring uh, kids in and get them back to manufacturing, uh, this is a question near and dear to my heart, as if you look at the early 2000s, uh, I know in the US, but I think partially globally, there was this pushback against manufacturing as being a dumb and dirty job, and most parents not necessarily wanting their kid to go out and work in a factory. Uh, and that, I think the feeling behind that is valid, but what's changed is that we've recognized, especially in the US, that there's huge benefits to having manufacturing in your economy. And if you look at an average manufacturing job, it actually supports two other jobs on average. And an advanced manufacturing job, like a 3D printing job, will support more than, more than seven jobs, up to about 12 uh, on average. So there's this huge economic spillover effect. So for inspiring kids, I think the key piece here is that we're connecting the digital world to the physical world. So if you look at how amazed and inspired kids get by a game like Minecraft, 
and how they can build in the digital world and have these collaborative creations, being able to effectively transition that type of playful learning into the physical world is something that 3D printing can enable um, and something that I think educational programs should really target. Yeah, come sign up. Thank you. All right, well, we want to thank you guys for coming. We want to thank all the speakers for doing a great job. We want to thank the translators uh, because you guys were amazing. And we want to thank uh, Sophie and Kintax because you guys did a great job organizing everything. It's been fun for the last two days, and we're looking forward to coming back again next year. We're still going to have the expo going on tomorrow, so please, uh, you know, please come back and visit tomorrow. Check out the expo. The robotics show is still going on upstairs tomorrow. There's going to be a whole bunch of sessions still taking place. So it's been really fun. Give yourselves a big round of applause because you guys are amazing. Thanks for coming to the show. Thank you, guys.